But this is not the only indirect good which Whitfield did in his day. He was among the first to show the right way to meet the attacks of infidels and sceptics on Christianity. He saw clearly that the most powerful weapon against such men is not cold, metaphysical reasoning and dry critical disquisition, but preaching the whole gospel, living the whole gospel, and spreading the whole gospel. It was not the writings of Leyland and the younger, and the younger Sherlock and Waterland and Leslie that rolled back the flood of infidelity one half so much as the preaching of Whitfield and his companions. They were the men who were the true champions of Christianity. Infidels are seldom shaken by mere abstract reasoning. The surest arguments against them are gospel truth and gospel life. Above all, he was the very first Englishman who seems to have thoroughly understood what Dr. Chalmers aptly called the aggressive system. He was the first to see that Christ's ministers must do the work of fishermen. They must not wait for souls to come to them, but must go after souls and compel them to come in. He did not sit tamely by his fireside like a cat on a rainy day, mourning over the wickedness of the land. He went forth to beard the devil in his high places. He attacked sin and wickedness face to face, and gave them no peace. He dived into holes and corners after sinners. He hunted out ignorance and vice wherever they could be found. In short, he set on foot a system of action which, up to his time, had been comparatively unknown in this country. But a system which, once commenced, has never ceased to be employed down to the present day. City missions, town missions, district visiting societies, open-air preachings, home missions, special services, theatre preachings, are all evidences that the value of the aggressive system is now thoroughly recognised by all the churches. We understand better how to go to work now than we did a hundred years ago. But let us never forget that the first man to commence operations of this kind was George Whitfield and let us give him the credit he deserves. The peculiar character of Whitfield's preaching is the subject which next demands some consideration. Men naturally wish to know what was the secret of his unparalleled success. The subject is one surrounded with considerable difficulty, and it is no easy matter to form a correct judgment about it. The common idea of many people that he was a mere commonplace ranting Methodist, remarkable for nothing but great fluency, strong doctrine and a loud voice, will not bear a moment's investigation. Dr. Johnson was foolish enough to say that he vociferated and made an impression, but never drew as much attention as a mountbank does and that he did not draw attention by doing better than others, but by doing what was strange. But Johnson was anything but infallible when he began to talk about ministers and religion. Such a theory will not hold water. It is contradictory to undeniable facts. It is a fact that no preacher in England has ever succeeded in arresting the attention of such crowds as Whitfield constantly addressed around London. No preacher has ever been so universally popular in every country that he visited, in England, Scotland, and America. 
No preacher has ever retained his hold on his hearers so entirely as he did for thirty-four years. His popularity never waned. It was as great at the end of his day as it was at the beginning. Wherever he preached, men would leave their workshops and employments to gather round him, and hear like those who heard for eternity. This of itself is a great fact. To command the ear of the masses for a quarter of a century, and to be preaching incessantly the whole time, is an evidence of no common power. It is another fact that Whitfield's preaching produced a powerful effect on people in every rank of life. He won the admiration of high as well as low, of rich as well as poor, of learned as well as unlearned. If his preaching had been popular with none but the uneducated and the poor, we might have thought it possible that there was little in it but the declamation and noise. But, so far from this being the case, he seems to have been acceptable to numbers of the nobility and the gentry. The Marquis of Lothian, the Earl of Leven, the Earl of Buchan, Lord Ray, Lord Dartmouth, Lord James A. Gordon, might be named among his warmest admirers, beside Lady Huntingdon and a host of ladies. It is a fact that eminent critics and literary men, like Lord Bolingbroke and Lord Chesterfield, were frequently his delighted hearers. Even the cold, artificial Chesterfield was known to warm under Whitfield's eloquence. Bolingbroke said, he is the most extraordinary man in our times. He has the most commanding eloquence I have ever heard in any person. Franklin the philosopher spoke in no measured terms of his preaching powers. Hume the historian declared that it was worth going twenty miles to hear him. Now facts like these can never be explained away. They completely upset the theory that Whitfield's preaching was nothing but noise and rant. Bolingbroke, Chesterfield, Hume, and Franklin were not meant to be easily deceived. They were no mean judges of eloquence. They were, probably, among the best qualified critics of the day. Their unbought and unbiased opinions appear to me to supply unanswerable proof that there must have been something very extraordinary about Whitfield's preaching. But still, after all, the question remains to be answered. What was the secret of Whitfield's unrivaled popularity and effectiveness? And I frankly admit that, with the scanty materials we possess for forming our judgment, the question is a very hard one to answer. The man who turns to the seventy-five volumes published under Whitfield's name will probably be much disappointed. He will see in them no commanding in intellect or grasp of mind. He will find in them no deep philosophy and no striking thoughts. It is only fair, however, to say that by far the greater part of these sermons were taken down in shorthand by reporters, and published without correction. These worthy men appear to have done their work very indifferently, and, very, and were evidently ignorant alike of stopping and paragraphing, of grammar and of gospel. The consequence is that many passages in these seventy-five sermons are what Bishop Latimer would have called a mingle-mangle and what we would call, in this day, a complete mess. No wonder that poor Whitfield says in one of his last letters, dated September, uh, September 26, 1769, I wish you had advertised against the publication of my last sermon. It is not verbatim as I delivered it. 
in some places it makes me speak false concord and even nonsense. In others the sense and connection are destroyed by injudicious disjointed paragraphs, and the whole is entirely unfit for public review.' 